Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our discussion today about the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021, which was signed into law on December 27th, just uh, a few less than two weeks ago, I would say. I've got some excellent presenters here with me today. My name is Sarah McGregor, and I'll be uh, sort of hosting it in the background. Uh, as we go through this presentation. But again, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. I know a couple of folks are still logging in, but we'll go ahead and get started. Just a quick reminder that we are going to go quickly through the uh, provisions that are in this act. So be sure that uh, you check in with us or with other advisors before you rely on any of the information here because your particular circumstances uh, may require further analysis to apply these rules. I'm delighted with our speakers today. Deb Walker is a, a director and leader of our compensation and benefits planning on the tax side. So she has been dealing with PPP loans and the compensation issues for those and with the employment credits uh, since they came out in the CARES Act and before. Uh, John Carpenter is with our advisory services team and he is leading our PPP loan initiative for consulting and assistance with our clients who are applying for loans, seeking forgiveness for loans, and assisting banks also with helping their customers with PPP loans. Ann Yancey is a director and she is a leader for our employment tax planning um, uh, services as well as dealing with state tax credits, which are also often tied to employees, training employees, and doing other work with employees. And our last presenter is Martin Karaman. He has uh, recently joined our firm. We're delighted to have him. And he specializes in credits and is a, a, takes a lead role with our credits and accounting methods team. So that's our folks today. You're going you're gonna to hear them talking. Um, and we've got a number of areas of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 to cover. First, we're going to talk about the changes to the employee retention credit and then some other credits that were also included in the bill. Then we'll have an update on the PPP loans and what's new in that program. And then a few other provisions related to benefits that were also included in the act. So with uh, that, let me go ahead and turn it over. I think, Martin, you're going to talk first about the employee retention credit and what's new. I am. Thank you. <clears throat> and thanks, everyone, for joining today. Yeah, we have uh, a lot of great enhancements to the employee retention credit. Um, and I'm just going to level set a little bit here. The employee retention credit was put in law under the CARES Act. It was effective as of March 13th last year. And, and it applies to certain eligible employers. And, and Deb Walker is going to talk about what more what the definitions are around eligible employers, but that have some decline in gross receipts in a particular quarter um, or are affected by certain government mandates that may cause a full or partial shutdown. To the extent those eligible employers pay their employees what's known as qualifying wages, which essentially is wages up to a certain limit. They're actually entitled to a uh, refundable payroll tax credit equal to half the amount that they pay. But we'll get into more of those rules in a second. Um, I think the most exciting thing around this right now is that the enhancements that came out of CAA now allow PPP borrowers to claim employee retention credit. So this opens up an opportunity for companies that had not previously even thought they could claim going back to March 13th to take another look and see if they uh, qualify as an eligible employer and see if they're entitled to the benefits of this, uh, of this tax credit. Additionally, in CAA, we find that uh, colleges and universities um, and also uh, government um, government owned facilities providing medical or, uh, or hospital care can now claim ERC as well. Deb's going to talk about some of the changes in the gross receipts test. Previously, it was a 50% decline in gross receipts. It's now for 2021 um, changed to just a 20% decline in gross receipts in a calendar quarter. And when I mentioned 2021, that's another enhancement because uh, up until <clears throat> a few weeks ago, the employee retention credit expired um, as of December 31st. It's now um, pushed forward two more quarters into Q1 and Q2 of 2021. There was another great enhancement because there are certain special rules for smaller companies. Um, in 2020, that applied to companies that were 100 employees or fewer. <clears throat> that now for 2021 is companies that are 500 employees or fewer. So that also opens up an opportunity to claim more credits on potentially more wages. Another great enhancement is that the credit itself for 2020 is a 50% credit 
Um, for 2021, that rate's been increased to 70%. And we'll get more into that. Deb's gonna talk about that for you. Um, <clears throat> again, this is a payroll tax credit. We're gonna be uh, focused on looking at the payroll tax filings on, for on Form 941, potentially on Form 7200. There's an opportunity to go back and do amended Form 941Xs. Um, and overall, the purpose of this credit um, for eligible employers um, that are larger companies is to get a credit for paying individuals that aren't able to provide services or aren't providing services once you're an eligible employer. A lot of times they're not be able to provide services due to the fact that there's some government mandate affecting the way the company operates. Um, but for the smaller companies, you can actually pick up all the wages paid to your individual employees up to a certain limit as well. So we'll talk about that in more detail. Why don't we move forward? I think I covered a little bit of this, but I'll just go through it to level set again. Um, the 20, this go, goes through and sort of sets out what the rules are for both 2020 and 2021 for ERC as amended by CAA. Again, we have a refundable payroll tax credit for eligible employers. The applicability uh, for 2020 is beginning on March 13th through the end of the year, and then it's going to continue for 2021 into the first two quarters. The credit amount, again, for 2020 is 50% of qualified wages, whereas for 2021, it's going to be 70%. So that maxes out of a credit of potentially $5,000 per employee in 2020, but $14,000 per employee in 2021. And again, we'll cover that in more detail. One important concept here um, for the companies to whom we speak is that when we're thinking about <clears throat> who is an eligible employer, um, when we're looking at the gross receipts test or we're counting the number of employees, we're thinking about this on a controlled group basis, essentially sort of an affiliated basis, similar to the R&D credit rules really, where we're thinking about companies that have affiliated, owner affiliated ownership of 50, 50 plus percent um, among a, a different groups of companies. So it's not location by location where you make this count, it is across the entire controlled group. I think Deb, you had some other comments yesterday that you wanted to mention here. Yeah, note the bottom two, the affiliated service group rules and organizations for which management functions are provided. These are rules that we find with retirement plans and when you run your retirement plan discrimination tests. So they go beyond ownership into people that are rendering services together or providing uh, management functions for each other, even if there's not common ownership. So it's, it's a little bit broader than just um, ownership. Okay, and I think I'm gonna hand it over to Deb in a second here, but again, we're focused on all employers, um, that includes tax exempts, and in 2021, we're talking about public colleges, universities, and also public healthcare organizations as well. And now we're gonna move on and talk a bit about what makes you an eligible employer under both the government mandate test and the gross receipts test. Deb? Thanks, Marty. So on the government mandate test, I mean, before I get into these tests, it's really exciting we all go oh great all these ppp borrowers can now take advantage of uh employee retention credit and as Anna will explain you can amend your past tax returns to claim these credits and but before you get too excited you have to make sure that you are an eligible employer if you're a ppp borrower or any borrower for that matter or anybody has to be an eligible uh, employer in order to claim these there's two different tests you can meet one is the government mandate test, and that's the test that was used by most people uh, in 2020 because it's a, a somewhat of a judgmental test. It's a test that applies if you are fully or partially suspended due to a government order from carrying on activities as you normally do. And the rules are broadened so that if you can't get supplies uh, because your suppliers are operating, then that also can be in, is included. Um, the credit is available only for the wages paid while this order is in place, but it's important to review the orders that exist and the types of entity, the orders will state the entities that it applies to and exactly what it applies. So when you're thinking about the government mandate test, it's important to, Sarah, if you wanna move the slides, the, a partial suspension is what most people find. And so when has a business had a partial suspension? And the, freak, and the um, IRS frequently asks questions 
use a concept of supply and they also use a concept of a nominal aspect of the business. The easiest thing for me to say to explain a nominal aspect of a business, in many cases, salad bars are shut down. Now, salad bar is not is really just a nominal part of a grocery store. On the other hand, a salad bar is a pretty major part of a restaurant. So in the case of a salad bar, if that was all that was shut down, the restaurant would have a partial suspension. On the other hand, if it was just the salad bar that was shut down, the grocery store probably would not have a partial suspension because it's just a nominal part of the business. When you're looking, once you have figured out if you have a partial suspension, it's going to apply to your entire controlled group. So that's a very favorable rule. What you do is you look for the for the uh, broadest government mandate, and then once you've found a partial shutdown, it applies to the whole group. Um, as I said, it's a supply concept. The fact that, well, nobody comes to our store because everybody's afraid of COVID, that is not a partial suspension. Or nobody comes to my store because you're supposed to shelter at home. That's not a partial suspension. It goes to uh, what the government has said you as providing a business have to do. And it's pretty clear in the frequently asked questions, if you're telecommuting and everybody's getting their work done, working from home, you haven't had a partial shutdown, even though we don't like that we can't go into the office. So let's move off from the uh, government mandate to the gross receipts test. And this is um, relatively simple. It's a decline of 50% during 2020. And what you do is you compare a 2020 calendar to quarter to the same calendar quarter in 2019. So if you're looking at uh, second quarter of 2020, you compare it to the second quarter of 2019, once you've had a 50% decline, then for 2020, that you continue to be able to take it on wages paid during those quarters until you reach an 80%. Um, only a 20% decline. And in the new law in 2021, basically the um, law changed to say you only need a 20% decline in gross receipts. You are, of course, looking at a controlled group basis when you're making this test. And in 2021, they have another favorable rule. Well, of course, you're looking at 2021 calendar quarters and comparing those to 2019. So that's a fair piece away and therefore more likely to have maybe had a decline. But you also can use the prior calendar quarter and compare that to 219. So for the first calendar quarter of 2021, you can do one of two things. You can look at the first quarter of 2021 gross receipts and compare them to the first quarter of 2019. Or you can look at the fourth quarter of 2020 the preceding calendar quarter and compare that to the same call calendar quarter in 2019, so the fourth quarter of 2019. So with that, let me turn it over to Anne, who I think is going to talk about qualified wages. Okay, thanks, Deb. Um, one of the most favorable provisions of the, the Appropriations Act um, is that qualified wages have now been increased. And it increased from a $10,000 wage limit for the whole year to $10,000 per quarter. So, that, so that's all good news in that it translates into an available credit, as Marty mentioned, of about $5,000, up to $5,000 per employee for 2020 and $14,000 in 2021. The Appropriation Act also increases really the definition of a large employer. And what that means is that in 2020, where we had to look at whether employers had 100 or fewer employees or more than 100 employees, now that threshold is 500. Very favorable provision here, which will allow more tax credit because now employers with less than 500 employees we can count all wages in the calculation of the tax credit and as opposed to um, having to look at only those individuals that were paid but were unable to render services. So uh, 
it actually helps from an administrative standpoint as well. Again, it makes it a lot easier if you have less than 500 employees. Okay, and looking at the definition of qualified wages, again, we're gonna be looking at W-2 wage information um, and also with included in the definition of qualified wages, even per the CARES Act, is that you're able to also include um, health plan costs that are paid out to the individuals during the period of the suspension um, of the business. So now under uh, the Appropriation Act, there's been no changes to the definition of health plan costs, but you can look at health plan costs across um, the whole uh, control group. Um, one other thing that the CARES Act also provided with respect to the health plan cost it, is it gave some clarity to the fact that if you had qualified wages uh, for an, in, or if, if you did not pay any qualified wages for an individual, but you had health plan costs, you can count those health plan costs um, in the calculation of the credit, even if you did not pay wages for an individual. Um, we've already talked about the control group rules. And again, you're gonna be looking at the items to test on a control group um, when you're looking at the 100 and 500 employee test and when you're looking at the gross receipts test. Um, also included in wages are gonna be wages that are gonna be paid by um, other third parties. So maybe you're leasing employees or if you're using a PEO where the wages are being reported under the PEO's federal ID number, those wages can be counted in your credit as well. Um, what's not included in wages for the calculation of the retention credit are gonna be wages that are already being taken into account for other tax credit purposes. So if you have employees that are already being counted for WOTC credits, we cannot take the same wages that are used for WOTC credits or for, for the paid leave credits under the Care um, Families First Act as well, or wages that are paid to related individuals um, and also an important criteria is going to be, we're going to have to look at make sure that wages which you're utilizing for the PPP loan forgiveness are also not being counted both for the retention credit and for the loan forgiveness as well. And John will talk a little bit more about that. Again, the benefits of the employee retention credit is that it is a refundable credit. Um, it is a credit that can be used to offset the employer social security tax. And in terms of uh, the ordering of the credit, you have to take all other credits first that are hiring based, which again are based on wages. Um, again, mentioning the family first paid sick leave and family medical leave credits if you're taking startup R&D credits or if you're taking veterans credits for nonprofits, those credits are um, counted first in the ordering of these credits and utilized first. Um, in terms of how to claim the credit, for 2021, the provisions are again favorable in that you can reduce your federal quarterly payroll tax deposits. If you wanna take an immediate cash benefit, However, I have found that uh, a lot of payroll providers are not providing that option to, um, to companies. So they make it a little more difficult to utilize an offset of the payroll tax deposits, but it certainly is available. Um, you can also file an amended return as necessary. And, and also for 2020, we can't again offset tax at this point since the year's over, but you can amend returns and follow 941X for 2020. Next slide. I'm gonna start. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I just wanna recap here. Okay. Um, it's, it's a really big opportunity for companies. I think about companies that, you know, didn't, that were PVP eligible and that didn't even think about this. What, what we're doing when we talk to our clients right now is we need to, we've all adapted to COVID by this point in time. But back in March, um, it was very new to us. And a lot of companies that were affected by government orders might have had a partial shutdown. So we need to put ourselves in the mindset of, of how the company was operating at that point. And then we look at whether or not you are an eligible employer. The other thing I wanted to make a point of is when we're looking at government orders, you may think about maybe where your headquarters is located. But to the extent you have 
a wide geographic footprint that may be subject to different orders across the country in different states. We look at each of those individually, and to the extent you're an eligible employer in one location, that does tend to translate across the entire trader business. So there's work that we are doing with our clients to make sure that we document appropriately that they're an eligible employer, and also there's probably more opportunity to um, fall into that definition than you might think about at first blush. But with that said, um, again, eligible employer uh, definition has been widely expanded. There's a lot of companies that are very interested in right now. The credit opportunities are very large. Um, and uh, especially now that we also have the ability to claim colleges, universities, and hospitals as well. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and just say, um, you know, there's, there's just a, quite a bit of opportunity for companies right now. And uh, it seems like a lot of people are very interested in taking a look. Uh, and I know we, the pandemic was a pretty tough year on everyone, but that was not the only disaster that was encountered this year. And uh, Congress was paying attention and put some things into the uh, the act to help out employers and employees in you know some of these natural disaster areas. Yes, um, thanks, Sarah. Yes, if there's also been a provision for a tax credit called a disaster retention credit, um, or we tend to refer to it as a disaster zone credit, not to confuse it with the other retention credits but this is a federal income tax credit to be claimed on a business tax return. So it's not a payroll credit, but it is available for employees that um, were located in a disaster zone that were active at the time of the disaster and they became inoperable and they continue to pay their workers during that disaster. So um, the eligible disasters are for um, any any disasters that occurred after January 1 of 2020 through February 25th of 2021, and any COVID-related disaster is not a, a disaster for this particular tax credit. Again, we've mentioned the period of the disasters um, that are eligible for the credit. The amount of the credit is a $2,400 credit per employee max. And that's based on the first $6,000 of wages that are paid to employees at a 40% credit rate. Um, again, you have to look at this credit in conjunction with the retention credit, with WOTC credits and other wage-based credits as well, so that you're not counting those wages twice. Um, but again, anyone that's in these areas. And on the next slide, we have a list of the disasters that qualify for this tax credit uh, for 2020. I mean, some of the, the larger disasters uh, were the California wildfires and Hurricane Sally in Florida and some Puerto Rico hurricanes as well. But again, the list is here for you to look at to see if you're impacted by uh, this pro the, these disasters and if there's a credit available. Next slide. The Appropriations Act also included um, some provisions or extensions of uh, tax credits that have been available for many years. Um, let's start with the paid sick and family leave credits. It's been extended through March 31st of 2020. Um, now the Appropriations Act did not extend um, the requirement to pay sick and family medical leave beyond 1231 of, of 2020, but if you are an employer that voluntarily has chosen to pay additional leave to your employees, then you can still take credit, uh, paid leave credits for, for that time period if, if the employee hasn't already exhausted their paid leave time. The last three credits, the Section 51 Work Opportunity Tax Credit, um, the 45S employer credit under family medical leave under the Family Medical Leave Act and the Indian Employment Credit. Um, these are all programs that were set to expire at 1231 that have been extended. And again, these are all hiring based credits. These are generally known as what were included in the extender bills every year. But you'll see the WATSI credit, 
and, and the family medical leave credit under 45S have been extended until 2025. Um, I will mention that one credit that is not on this page that I noticed is the empowerment zone credit. Um, and that's for individuals that live in a distress, live and work in a distressed area um, that you hire. That has also been extended until December 31st of 2025. So happy to answer any questions if you have any on, on these particular programs. So I, the takeaways really um, with respect to the retention credit in terms of how to claim the credit is you really need to think about um, working with your payroll provider to make sure that the tax, the tax credits are included on any uh, 941s that you file or the, the most advantageous method of claiming the credit, again, whether you apply in advance for some of the credits um, or whether you offset your tax deposit. We have seen that uh, the IRS has sent a lot of notices with respect to inaccurate 941s or incomplete 941s or um, errors on the 941 that have also occurred. So I would definitely pay attention to the 941 and certainly um, we're available to help review that in the case if, if you need us to do that. Um, we also, where we've seen problems with the calculation of the retention credit is that, again, companies may be taking multiple types of credit and participating in multiple programs under the CARES Act, the Family First Act, or, or other hiring related credits, and they're not taking those into account in terms of the proper calculation of the retention credit and how these credits interplay you know, with, with the retention credit. But uh, again, I think it's a great opportunity, as everyone mentioned, um, it should be a significant benefit to the majority of companies now, especially with the PPP loan. Um, addition to the, uh, to the act. So we're certainly happy to help anyone that is uh, in need of help with this. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we're going to switch gears from the uh, employee retention credit over to be talking about the improvements and expansion and enhancements to the Paycheck Protection Program loans. Uh, sorry, the, Deb, this is Deb. And what I was gonna do was lead in on some of the key PPP loan changes. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is the change in the rule regarding whether expenses are going to be deductible. But then we're also going to move on to what a lot of people, or at least through my email traffic, are showing up is, do I get to uh, apply for a second draw PPP loan? And what are the rules with that? In addition to making loans available, second draw loans available, there are also a number of changes for your first, uh, for the first loans. And in some cases, first, borrow, first loan borrowers are going to be able to increase the amount that they were able to first get. Regulations changed, some of the rules changed, and people can go in for more under the first, uh, the first program. Uh, the SBA has started audits. They've said they're going to audit any loan in excess of $2 million, um, and they're doing that through a questionnaire, which we'll talk about. And finally, as I think Ann and Martin pointed out, we have to be careful that we don't use the same wage for PPP loan forgiveness as we use for the employee retention credit. So in some cases, when you're doing your forgiveness application, for the, you want to maybe just decrease the uh, covered payroll amount by $10,000 per employee and in 2020 for the 2020 letter loans, and then you'll be able to, in fact, use that for an employee retirement, uh, employee retention credit, assuming you're an eligible employer. So what are we going to know about the income tax reporting? Lots of hoopla last fall because the expenses were deemed to be non-deductible by the administration through a notice and a revenue ruling. Um, a lot of people disagreed with the reasoning about uh, 
that the IRS and Treasury had taken in that guidance, um, but IRS and Treasury didn't really care, I don't believe. However, Congress did, and Congress changed the rules. So now all these PPP loan related expenses are deductible, excuse me, and they're going to be reported as an expense just like any other business expense on your tax return. There's no special treatment when you get to your financial statements. They're just expense like you would on your financial statements for any other expense or capitalize if needed be. Now, debt forgiveness is still tax exempt income. It does not include it in income for tax purposes, although it is for financial statement purposes. So that does end up with a financial statement impact through your tax provision and the change in your rate. Um, the law thought this through and in fact gave increases in basis for pass through owners and increase in E and P for C corporations. So let's just talk a little bit about some of these problems because the problems come about with pass through owners. And that's because the timing of the expenses is going to be in 2020 and the forgiveness is going to be in 2021. So that means your tax exempt earnings increasing your basis, which could allow you to deduct a loss is going to occur in 2021. So you have a timing difference that partnerships need to worry about. You also have uh, a change in ownership. You might have a change in partners in one year compared to the second year when the forgiveness is obtained or an S corp shareholders could change. So, um, and, and that is the biggest thing that, although these expenses are deductible, we need to in fact make sure that the taxpayer in the case of the pass-through entity has enough basis to deduct the losses. So I think Sarah was gonna talk a little bit more about the partnership. Uh, yes. So just a couple of quick thoughts on partnerships and uh, one small on S corporations. So generally you think that, well, a partner's basis would be increased by their share of the partnership's liabilities, which would include that PPP loan that's on the books. So uh, I shouldn't have any trouble deducting my uh, losses passed through from that um, partnership. However, you do have a second test and that is the at-risk rules of section 465. And to the extent that a partner, uh, that that loan is non-recourse to a partner, which is gonna be pretty much all partners uh, are gonna be in this situation with regard to PPP loans, uh, they'll not be able to get those losses through that next hurdle of uh, am I the partner at risk for economic loss related to this loan. So that's why we think there's still going to be an issue and a potential issue for timing, taking deductions one year and receiving that debt forgiveness income in a succeeding year. <clears throat> there's also a second limitation here, and that is that uh, for partners who receive a deduction of PPP loan related expenses, the amount of debt forgiveness that can increase their basis will be limited to the amount of the deductions taken. So no more than that. You can see here a real quick example I put together where if there were $8,000 of expenses, uh, PPP loan related expenses allocated to this partner, but $10,000 of forgiveness income was allocated, then that particular partner would only be able to increase their basis by $8,000 of that tax exempt income. Say, well, how could that happen? Well, this might be a change in allocation rules. It could be losses are allocated under one set of rules, income allocated under a different set of guidelines or timing. Uh, it could be the change in ownership that happened during the year. The last point I'll make um, for S corporations, we do have to consider the ordering rules of uh, distributions out of S corporations. Uh, first, they come out of accumulated adjustments account, and then they come out of any C corporation accumulated earnings and profits, it might still be within the S corporation, and then out of the other adjustments, which inc would include where the tax exempt income would be located. So just another thing to keep in mind uh, looking at your S corporation distributions, if you don't have any uh, earnings and profits, C corporation earnings and profits, then, then S corporations should not have to worry about, um, about this situation. So, uh, Deb, I'll pass it back to you to talk about, or uh, John, to talk about who can, about second draw loans. Yes. 
Hey, Sarah, thank you. Uh, so let's talk about uh, PPP second, what are called second draw loans, <clears throat> or I think uh, for our purposes, we'll probably just affectionately refer to it as PPP2. Um, everybody had a lot of fun with PPP1, and here we go again. So who is eligible uh, or qualifies for a, a PPP2 loan? Start To start off with, uh, you either must have received a PPP1 loan and and be prepared to qualify for forgiveness or to have spent or going to spend all the PPP funds. That's one big criteria. If for some reason your business just decided you didn't need PPP one back in the spring and opted not to apply, then I'm sorry, you will not be able to apply or receive a, a PPP two loan. But there are some uh, entities which were brought into the fold by the Appropriations Act that was passed. And let's hit on those real quick. In the nonprofit world, uh, in the first round of PPP, 501c3s, 501c7, uh, veterans organizations uh, were allowed to get PPP loans. Now 501c6s that have limited lobbying or political activities are eligible. In the first round, Certain media companies like local news, TV, and radio stations were deemed to be affiliates uh, because they might have all been part of, say, the, the NBC network or something like that. It's now been, been stated that those news outlets, as long as they have 500 or fewer employees per location, uh, can get their, PP, their own PPP loan. Cooperatives electrical co-ops, telephone co-ops, um, certain of those entities are now eligible for a PPP loan. And lastly, what are called destination marketing organizations, won't go into a lot of detail there, but uh, organizations that are not primarily engaged in lobbying activities, but are existing to promote uh, generally promoting tourism, convention, and other type business in a certain destination. Those organizations, uh, if they meet certain criteria, are now, now eligible for PPP. For the vast majority of, of people out there who got PPP loans and are looking at a second draw loan, these last two items at the bottom are really what you need to focus on um, in most cases. One is you may recall the first time around, uh, bar companies that on an affiliated basis had no more than 500 full-time employees were eligible. That number has been dropped to 300 now for the second round. Secondly, um, there is a gross receipts test that was certainly not present in, the, in PPP-1. And that is on an affiliated basis, um, you must be able to show a 25% decline in gross receipts, either for one quarter, any quarter of 2020 compared to that same quarter of 2019, or you are allowed to use the full year of 2020 versus the full year of 2019. Uh, we've already had one question come up uh, internally. Uh, what if you're a fiscal year company? Um, do you, do you still use calendar quarters? <clears throat> the guidance is not really clear on this. We tend to think you do use calendar quarters, but that's one of many questions still out there. Who does not qualify for a PPP2 loan? Well, one, uh, one set of entities who, who now have really their own special program are what are called shuttered venues. And here we're talking about primarily entertainment venues, theaters, movie, th uh, uh, movie theaters, concert halls, museums, uh, and other type venues that, that host live entertainment, and obviously, Many, if not most, if not all those venues have really been closed since COVID broke out in March. Well, there is a shuttered venue grant program that has been set up by SBA. And, and that, and we're, and we're gonna have some more information once guidance comes out, that'll talk about the details of that program. But 
those type of venues, which are now eligible some, for some very attractive grants, not loans, these are grants, <clears throat> if they either obtain or are going to obtain a grant under that program, then they may not also get PPP. It's, there was a lot of publicity in uh, earlier in the program about public companies. Most people remember the Shake Shack scandal. Uh, it's now been made clear by SBA, if you're a public company, you cannot get a PPP2 loan, no matter, no matter even if you're a very small public company, any kind of public, if you're any kind of an SEC filer, uh, you could not get a PPP2 loan. And lastly, uh, companies that, that have either significant operations in China or Hong Kong, have a lot of affiliates or, or ultimate parents in China or Hong Kong, or have board members in China, are not going to be eligible for the second round of PPP. So how much can you get? with a second draw loan. And, and there's some consistency here with the first round, but there's some big changes too. Um, what is consistent with the first round is that for most businesses, the amount of your loan, the maximum amount of your loan is gonna be two and a half times either your 2019 average monthly payroll cost or your full year 2020 average monthly payroll cost or if you want to, you can use your rolling 12 month average monthly payroll. Now we're recording this webinar on uh, in early January and for most everybody that rolling 12 month average is gonna be the same as the 2020 average monthly payroll. But borrowers should definitely look at which, which is higher, 2019 or 2020 and whichever one is higher, you can take two and a half times that amount. Don't forget payroll cost includes not just wages, but includes employer portion of certain benefits such as medical, dental, vision, also now includes life and disability. Uh, companies who operate in the hospitality industry, which is defined as any business that whose NAICS code starts with 72, this is typically gonna be restaurants, hotels, motels, uh, those kind of entities. Hospitality industry employers get uh, a bonus in that they can use three and a half times those average monthly payrolls to calculate their loan. Everyone is capped at $2 million. So 2 million is the max loan you can get no matter what your payroll is. And that last bullet is, is frankly not entirely clear in the guidance, but we believe that, that all PPP borrowers are capped at $10 million between their first draw and second draw loan. Uh, there's, there's inquiries into SBA as to whether that's really what they intended. There's some reference to that in their guidance, but uh, that, that point is still uh, not really 100% clear. And then there is, uh, there is provision in the guidance that talks about an additional disbursement of PPP-1 loan funds and here also, everyone is, is hoping to get some better guidance from SBA on how this is gonna work. But, but the law and, and SBA's initial guidance, which was only released not even a week ago, does speak to the ability of borrowers who either returned uh, or repaid part of their PPP loan or borrowed less than the maximum that they were entitled to, probably just through not understanding necessarily how the program worked, there is provision that they can reapply to their lender for an additional advance. And this is really considered like an addition to a PPP-1 loan. This would not substitute for getting a PPP-2 loan. Uh, certainly if you operate a seasonal business or if there were changes in the regulations, which heaven knows there were plenty of those that happened between April and July of 2020, then if it's possible that you either did not borrow the maximum amount you were entitled to or returned money thinking that you were not entitled to it, but ultimately you are, then you should definitely talk to your lender about getting a, a re-advance under PPP-1. They've made a few changes to the forgiveness process. The basic forgiveness process is going to work just like it is working now for PPP-1. Um, 
But Congress has, has added some additional categories of expenses that now qualify for forgiveness and, and thus qualify as costs that you can use your PPP money to, to satisfy. And we won't go through all of these in great detail, but it's things like software and cloud computing costs, uh, certain HR and accounting costs. One typical question that we heard a lot last spring was, hey, I can count payroll costs, but can I include the costs that I pay to say to my outside payroll provider or to my PEO? Well, previously those costs were not eligible for PPP, now they are. Certain covered supplier costs are now eligible for PPP. The expenditures that you might have made for worker protection, and this is really COVID related. So if you had to uh, change the physical layout of your office or plant or workspace to uh, provide greater protection for workers or customers from COVID, that's eligible now. Uh, expansion of your business space to accommodate the, the social distancing requirements. Any uninsured uh, property damage costs incurred in your business as a result of some of the civil disturbances that occurred in many towns and cities uh, during the summer of 2020 are now eligible. In the benefits area, uh, group life and disability was not an eligible expense, and we're talking employer portion only was not an eligible expense in the first round. It is eligible now. And in fact, it is eligible as a forgivable expense if you've not yet gotten forgiveness on your first loan. And although fairly small dollars involved here, if you happen to get an economic injury disaster loan advance, and these were limited to 10,000 max, so these were not very big, but if you happen to get an EIDL advance, up till last week, those advances were being deducted from your forgiveness amount. Those are no longer being deducted from your forgiveness amount uh, per some new guidance from SBA. And then probably a couple of the other changes in, uh, in forgiveness, uh, probably the biggest one is that uh, on PPP2 loan, borrowers can now choose in their covered period really any time period between 8 and 24 weeks. For all of you who got a PPP loan, and even if you've uh, looked at all at the forgiveness application, you've seen that currently with your forgiveness period, you just have to check one box or the other. It's either 8 or 24 weeks. Borrowers are allowed to apply early before 20, earlier than their 24-week period was over. Uh, but, but on the application itself, one had to check either eight or 24 weeks. Now on PPP2, that's no longer going to be the case. You can pick any day as long as it's between eight and 24 weeks. We think the real advantage to this is that if you are managing uh, either your FTE count or salaries and hourly wages, and perhaps having to look at make, making some reductions in either FTEs or wages, then being able to choose a, a firm date for the end of the forgiveness period gives you a lot more flexibility from a management standpoint uh, to feel comfortable that making any of those required reductions is not going to impact your forgiveness amount. Uh, we do point out there is still the limitation on, on forgiveness in that uh, you're only allowed to claim forgiveness for that portion of wages up to $100,000 annualized. In a 15, I'm sorry, in a uh, eight-week period, uh, you may recall that number is 15,385, and in a 24-week period, that number is 46,154. If you're picking a forgiveness period between eight and 24 weeks, you have to prorate that 46,154. So in our example here, you pick a 15-week period and that per employee wage cap becomes 28,846. <clears throat> there is uh, the promise from SBA of a, of a simplified forgiveness application and process for loans of 150,000 and under. Um, that is, has not really been released yet, uh, but I would say for anyone listening who has a loan under 150,000, um, it probably makes sense to wait at least a few more weeks before you think about forgiveness um, because there could be more changes. 
And if you're contemplating getting a PPP2 loan, then there's no reason, no reason to wait. Uh, go ahead and, and proceed with that. And we'll see whether the rules on forgiveness of those smaller loans actually comes to pass. And then really just uh, a couple more things to touch on, uh, really as, as Deb and Ann have referenced already, um, there is, it does require some planning, but there's some great planning opportunities to coordinate what you're gonna do to possibly get employee retention credits and what you're gonna do for PPP loan forgiveness. That first bullet is really the, the key point here. Uh, you can't use the same wages for both forgiveness and the employee retention credit. But as we, as we outline a little bit here on this timeline, you know, let's just say, for example, if you uh, have a PPP2 loan that gets funded on April 22nd of this year, and you carry your, your forgiveness period through October 6th, well, two things to consider. One is that wages uh, prior to when the PPP loan is funded can be used for ERC because they're not eligible for forgiveness. And of course, wages after your forgiveness period ends uh, are eligible for ERC, but cannot be used for forgiveness. Also consider that, that quite possibly the wages you're gonna pay during the forgiveness period are, could be far above what you need for forgiveness. And if they are, then you really only need to claim forgiveness on the portion of wages up to your loan amount and anything over that is eligible to be used for ERC. Uh, but for everyone, this is gonna require some planning and some thought and, uh, and probably some budgeting over how you think wage levels are gonna carry on through the balance of the year. And then really the last thing we wanna to touch on real quick is just uh, make everyone aware if, if you're not already, uh, SBA did release two different um, loan necessity questionnaires. Uh, these were released a little over a month ago and uh, and, and this is part of their audit process of PPP loans that are two million or greater. This includes on a on an, on a uh, an affiliated basis. So if you have one, if your entity, if your affiliated entities in total have PPP loans of two million or greater, then all of those PPP borrowers must complete uh, one of these questionnaires. And uh, and if you have not uh, seen these questionnaires yet. If you fit this category, I would strongly encourage you to go out to the SBA website or contact us and we can send you examples. Uh, there, there are two different questionnaires out there. One is the Form 3509, which is for for-profit borrowers, and then 3510 is for nonprofits. These are very detailed questionnaires. Um, they are, there's not really a defined process for how they're being distributed to borrowers. Uh, we are seeing that SBA, when they review some larger loans, they are going back to the lender and, and having them forward the questionnaire to the borrower. Once you get the questionnaire, you only have 10 days to complete it and send it back to your lender. Uh, that's a pretty short timeline. And these questionnaires are quite lengthy, uh, quite detailed. Uh, they are they're including uh, disclosures of non-tax distributions paid to owners, doing revenue comparisons, uh, details on expenditures that are paid in the business to, to uh, change the physical space or accommodate worker safety, uh, detailed schedules about wages paid to any owner or employee at a rate of 250,000 annualized or more, uh, and detailed questions about the characteristics of ownership, including if there's any uh, any public stakeholders, private equity owners, venture capital, or foreign owners. Um, so, if you if you've uh, not started one of these questionnaires, but you think you're going to be subject to it, uh, strongly suggest you get a hold of the form and start gathering information now. Because especially if you have multiple businesses that got PPP loans, if you have to do multiple questionnaires, uh, ten days might be a mighty short time to get that done. Sarah, that's all I got. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, and others, I, I don't think we can overstate the complexity of these new new rules and new, but also I don't think we can overstate the opportunities that are available as well. 
So um, let's wrap up, Deb. I think you had a couple of other provisions in the act you wanted to make sure that we mentioned when regard to employee benefits. Right, and the biggest one is I think there's a extension of the tax-free reimbursements that are available for student loan debt. So an employer, if they want to, can pay up to $52,500 per person per year for student qualified higher education debt. It has to be pursuant to a written plan. It has to be on a non-discriminatory basis. You have to notify employees of the availability of this, um, and it can't be salary reduction. But it is available now uh, through 2025. It expired in 2020. But given that we have five years that uh, people may, in fact, decide to use this because it really would be a good tax-free benefit for many people with student loans. Uh, the other one is dependent care and flexible spending accounts. With COVID, everything was so turned upside down with health care and child care expenses that the uh, IRS has ex really liberalized the rules on when you can use those expenses, allowing carryovers between years uh, and changes in elections whenever you would like them. So um, those are two favorable things that came to us out of COVID. And the very last one I'll go to before we sign off is the um, employer payroll tax deferral, which was the Social Security taxes due for 2020. Nothing changed with that with respect to the legislation. Those amounts uh, now have to be paid for the 2021 year, and these deferrals are due at the end of 2021 and at the end of 2022. You can prepay them if you want, and there are uh, instructions for doing that. Then, as far as the employee elected payroll tax deferral, that was the uh, employees could choose not to pay Social Security taxes for the last four months of 2020 uh, after the uh, president issued a memorandum saying that the rules should be changed. The requirement when IRS wrote the rules was that it had, they had to be repaid January 1st through April 30th. This legislation expends extends that repayment date from January 1st to December 31st. It, the notice does say that amounts have to be spent, uh, paid ratably. So we sh anybody that had an employee deferral of Social Security taxes should be uh, catching up on that deferral now, but it's over a 12 month period. And with that, I think it's it, Sarah. Yes, that is uh, that is a lot that we have covered today. Uh, thank you to Deb Walker and Yancey, Marty Kerman, and John Carpenter for your leadership and guidance on, on these new rules. Uh, please reach out to these folks if you have questions. We have received your questions in the questions pod, and we'll be following up with you, those that we did not get answered during the session. Uh, we'll also be having more information on our firm's website, and a copy of this presentation uh, will be made available on our website uh, in a, in a few days. Thank you all. Have a good day.